Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times in paradise of East Bumblefuck, New Mexico on this spectacular spring morning, Sunday morning, April 9th, 2017. So Sunday morning is when your old doomsday preacher, Hambone, brings you his doomsday sermon where I share with you one of my new favorite Bibles of the Apocalypse that I have stumbled upon in my research of the decline and fall of a planet. And the latest is uh, that I have to share with you is by not... Most of the book is not so much a Bible of the Apocalypse. It's just an explanation of how we got to the edge of the apocalypse by this fellow <coughs> normally not not so much an eco-nazi but a damn entertaining writer named Bill Bryson. Bill Bryson, I've read many of his books and this is uh, Bill's exhaustive catalog called A Short History of Nearly Everything. There you go. He gets, He just covers the whole gamut. So, but we're going to dive, a little bit of a spoiler alert, I'm going to go to the very last chapter, okay, and I encourage you to read this book yourself, so uh, if you're planning to read this book, just let, I'm letting you know this is a spoiler alert. So I'm going to read from the opening and the closing of the last chapter, appropriately titled, Goodbye. Goodbye, where Bill Bryson visits the sixth mass extinction on this planet. And uh, starting with his discussion of the <clears throat> dodo bird. Uh, this was on the island of Mauritius, far out in the Indian Ocean, some 800 miles off the east coast of Madagascar. There, some forgotten sailor or sailor's pet was harrying to death the last of the dodos, the famously flightless bird whose dim but trusting nature and lack of leggy zip made it a rather irresistible target for bored young tars on shore leave. <clears throat> Millions of years of peaceful isolation had not <clears throat> prepared the dodo for the erratic and deeply unnerving behavior of human beings. We don't know precisely the circumstances or even the year attending the last moments of the last dodo, so we don't know which arrived first, a world that contained a principia or one that had no dodos, but we know that they happened at more or less the same time. You would be hard pressed, I would submit, to find a better pairing of occurrences to illustrate the divine and felonious nature of the human being, a species of organism that is capable of unpicking the deepest secrets of the heavens while at the same time pounding into extinction for no purpose at all. A creature that never did us any harm and was not even remotely capable of understanding what we were doing to it as we did it. The indignities of the poor dodo did not quite end there. In 70... 1755, some 70 years after the last Dodo's death, the director of the museum in Oxford decided that the institution's stuffed Dodo was becoming unpleasantly musty and ordered it tossed on a bonfire. This was a surprising decision, as it was by this time the only Dodo in existence, stuffed or otherwise. A passing employee, aghast, tried to rescue the bird, but could save only its head and part of one limb. And then he states the very same thing happened with the very last Carolina parakeet. 
thrown out with the garbage. And the very last, uh, well, some say the very last Tasmanian tiger, the last thylacine after it died, thrown out in the garbage. But I tend to believe that thylacines are still alive. Anyway, um, so as a result of this and other departures from common sense, we are not now entirely sure what a living dodo was like. Uh, so he, he just tries to piece together uh, from rumor uh, what dodos were like. <clears throat> from beginning to end, our acquaintance with animate dodos lasted just 70 years. That is a breathtakingly scanty period, though it must be said that by this point in our history, we did have thousands of years of practice behind us in the matter of irreversible eliminations. Nobody knows quite how destructive human beings are, but it is a fact that over the last 50,000 years or so, wherever we have gone, animals have tended to vanish in often astonishingly large numbers. <clears throat> in America, 30 genera, I thought it was 15, but according to Bill, well, in the Americas, in, in, in North America and South America, in the Americas, 30 genera of large animals disappeared practically at a stroke after the arrival of modern humans on the continent between 10 and 20,000 years ago. <clears throat> Altogether, North and South America between them lost about three quarters of their big animals once man the hunter arrived with his flint-headed spears and keen organizational capabilities. <clears throat> Europe and Asia, where the animals had longer to evolve a useful wariness of humans, lost between a third and a half of their big creatures, and Australia, for exactly the opposite reasons, lost no less than 95% of, of their uh, megafauna. You know, this is Bill Bryson weighing in uh, about the noble savage. Uh, the, these Australian aborigines that there's some fucking myth by these bleeding heart liberals that Australian aborigines gave a flying fuck uh, about animals. They wiped out 95% of them before Honky ever got there. And uh, so then, of course, uh, he goes in a little bit about this climate change debate, at least for the North American ones. But you cannot use that climate change horseshit argument about the South American extinctions uh, happening after, hum after those noble savages arrived down there in the Amazon jungle in the Andes. Uh, you cannot use it for Australia. You sure as shit cannot use it for New Zealand and Madagascar. I anyway, I'm getting off on my own rant. Okay, diving back in to uh, Bill Bryson's Bible of the Apocalypse. <clears throat> Some of the creatures that were lost were singularly spectacular and would take a little managing if they were still around. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. <clears throat> the question that arises is whether the disappearances of the Stone Age and disappearances of more recent times are in effect part of a single extinction event. Whether, in short, humans are inherently bad news for other living things. <clears throat> the sad likelihood is that we may well be. You think so? According to the University of Chicago paleontologist David Raup, the back 
background rate of extinction on Earth throughout biological history has been one species lost every four years on average. According to one recent calculation, human-caused extinctions now may be running as much as 120,000 times the natural level. Uh, then he looks, let's see, he goes through our, he just picks out a few. Uh, here is the stellar sea cow, how we uh, wipe them off the planet. Blah, blah, blah. He talks about the Carolina parakeet being uh, just blown off the planet. A great deal of extinction hasn't been cruel or wanton, but just kind of majestically foolish. In 1894, when a lighthouse was built on a lonely rock called Stevens Island, in the strait between the North and South Islands of New Zealand, the lighthouse keeper's cat kept bringing him strange little birds that it had caught. The keeper dutifully sent some specimens to the museum in Wellington. There, a curator grew very excited because the bird was a relic species of, fright, of flightless wren the only example of a flightless perching bird ever found anywhere. He set off at once for the island, but by the time he got there, the cat had killed them all. One cat taking out an entire species of animal. Uh, what is... Uh, what is both most intriguing and puzzling about this story of, is talking about the Carolina parakeet story that Peel was a lover of birds and yet did not hesitate to kill them in large numbers for no better reason than it interested him to do so. It is a, stru a truly astounding fact that for the longest time, the people who were most intensely interested in the world's living things were the ones most likely to extinguish them. He talks about the Bachman Warbler, how it was bird watchers, uh, bird watchers were the ones who exterminated the Bachman's Warbler off the face of the planet. Then he goes into the tragedy of the Hawaiian birds. Uh, good Lord. Then he talks about all of these predator control programs that are, that are still going on and ramping up. Uh, you know, there's this goddamn wildlife services, uh, just about our, our absolute war on, on predators. Uh, and then he finishes up with the Tasmanian tiger down there in Australia, as I say, which we're hoping is still alive. But we're going to get to the very last uh, sermon in the book where where Bill Bryson brings a short history of nearly everything to its obvious end. I mention all this, all of these stories about the uh, human cause six extinction, to make the point that if you were designing an organism to look after life in our lonely cosmos, to monitor where it is going and keep a record of where it has been, you would not choose human beings for the job. But here's an extremely salient point. We have been chosen by fate or providence or whatever you wish to call it. As far as we can tell, we are the best there is. We may be all there is. 
it's an unnerving thought that we may be the living universe's supreme achievement and its worst nightmare simultaneously. Because we are so remarkably careless about looking after things, both when alive and when not, talking about throwing away all of these extinct animals, we have no idea, really, none at all, about how many things have died off permanently, or may soon, or may never, and what role we have played in any part of the process. Um, then he breaks, then he goes into all of these wildly varying estimates of these background extinction rates. Uh, that, that all of these people who study this, nobody knows uh, how, how destructive we really are. The fact is, we don't know, don't have any idea. We don't know when we started doing many of the things we have done. We don't know what we are doing right now or how our present actions will affect the future. What we do know is that there is only one planet to do it on and only one species of being capable of making a considered difference. Edward O. Wilson expre expressed it with unimprovable brevity in the diversity of life. Quote, one planet, one experiment. If this book has a lesson, it is that we are awfully lucky to be here. And by we, I mean every living thing. To attain any kind of life in this universe of ours appears to be quite an achievement. As humans, we are doubly lucky, of course. We enjoy not only the privilege of existence, but also the singular ability to appreciate it and even in a multitude of ways to make it better. It is a talent we have only barely begun to grasp. We have arrived at this position of eminence in a stunningly short time. Behaviorally modern human beings, that is, people who can speak and make art and organize complex activities, have existed for only about 0.0000 1% of Earth's history. But surviving for even that little while has required a nearly endless string of good fortune. We really are just at the beginning of it all. The trick, of course, is to make sure we never find the end. And that almost certainly will require a good deal more than lucky breaks. <laughs> lucky breaks. Yes. Uh, good luck, humanity. So there you go. That is, uh, that is as close as Bill Bryson can come to a Hollywood happy ending in a short history of nearly everything winding up with humans, humans taking out everything on this planet. But I gotta wrap up this uh, week's doomsday sermon. Amen, Brother Bill and prepare, I guess I'm getting ready to be interviewed for, for Environmental Coffee House. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Environmental Coffee House is ready for Hambone Little Tail or not, but we'll see how that hap unfolds. For this sermon, bye guys. <laughs>